Welcome, everyone, to an exciting episode of Conversational Pace. We have our first uh, repeat shoe on the channel. This is the first shoe. Well, this Brooks Caldera is the first shoe review that we ever did. And now this is the first update that we're ever going to do. So we have the Brooks Caldera 7 today. And these shoes were provided to us by Brooks and Running Warehouse, but we're under no financial obligation to say whether we like a product or not, because we want to keep these reviews authentic and beneficial for you. No one will get to preview or watch this footage before it gets published to YouTube. Two things I got to say. One, we're becoming old and we're becoming the establishment in the trail running review sphere. I love which it. Is, which is kind of <laughs> cool. I kind of dig that. Second, I should say, so my, my other gig, I run a media company called Single Track. We do have... Uh, a pretty significant 2024 year partnership creating content around various races, various athletes. I have received pairs of shoes from Brooks in the past related to that. And so I will attempt to be as unbiased in this review as possible, but we do extremely value transparency here at CP and I wanted to level with you up front. So I'll do my best, but you should know that as the viewer. I appreciate it. Appreciate the uh, the double disclaimer. I mean, I know that's what all the viewers are here for is to uh, just listen to double disclaimers. But I think it's I think it's worth noting though. Some stats about the Brooks Caldera Seven. This one comes in at one hundred fifty dollars. The weight of my pair in a U.S. size ten came in at eleven point three ounces, three hundred twenty grams. Smidge lighter than the Caldera Six. The stack height. So. Th this is just kind of annoying. Uh, they now have listed a 20 millimeter forefoot, 26 millimeter heel, but that is just the midsole foam. On the mm. previous Caldera, they had the entire shoe stack height listed, which was like outsole, midsole plus insole. So on the previous review, I have 33, 39. This new Caldera did not get thinner, even though now the stack height numbers make it look like it got chopped you know by a third that's not the case um so no reduced stack height no um but okay. they're just measuring the the midsole foam it would be nice if there was like a universal rule for measuring stack height but there is not so that's a which bummer. is interesting because i felt more ground feel in this version than i did in the six for whatever reason yeah and who knows we'll dive into it like maybe it's the new foam maybe it's the the new outsole pattern um but it didn't get any thinner. Still okay. retains its six millimeter drop. We're definitely seeing quite a few changes uh, from Caldera 6 to Caldera 7 in terms of the material. So this shoe gets an entire new upper. It's a two layer system now. So directly up against the foot is a very soft, flexible, breathable, just comfort mesh. And then there's this external plastic cage, which, yeah, it's like a plastic woven mesh and they're calling it kind of like your exoskeleton. It, it, it definitely eliminates the need for additional overlays because you're kind of almost in a way creating an entire overlay over the whole shoe with the second layer, but mm. it's supposed to be thinner and not retain as much moisture um, as well as not change as much over time. Still a pretty robust toe bumper. We're looking at a uh, gusseted tongue with, I would say this falls into the light, lightly padded tongue category. What do you think? Yep. Um, yeah, this is the exact amount of material that I want in any tongue. Like if this actually, like one of the things I like the most about this upper is the tongue construction. Yep. Yep. So it's a nice gusseted thin tongue, ghillie style lacing system, little elastic, uh, I don't know, tie down for your extra laces we are got a pretty robust, stiff heel cup, a uh, pretty high padded ankle collar. We got a Velcro um, gaiter attachment point, although there is no like D-ring on the front, which I thought was interesting. So you just got to clip the front of your gaiter to the bottom of the lace. Yep. That's it for the, that's it for the upper. We got a few more um, mystery, uh, mystery signs on the side. You know, we got a cloud with a plus sign. Illuminati. Got, yes. I have, n I have no idea what these are. Um, like a, cl a cloud with a plus sign, like what appears to be a sun sort of thing, but it's like a yin-yang in a perfect 50-50 circle. And then um, I don't, like a Canadian Inukshuk maybe. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. 
I, I need to go rewatch National Treasure to see if we can make any sense of this. Yeah, Brooks is definitely trying to tell us something, and I am not smart enough to put it together. <laughs> it's called Nicolas Cage. The midsole is a new DNA Loft V3 foam. So this is the nitrogen-infused EVA. This is the exact same midsole that we're seeing in all of Brooks' daily road trainers. So the Brooks Ghost, uh, the Glycerin, I'll get this new DNA Loft V3. And it's a little bit lighter, delivers more energy return than the previous DNA Loft V2. They also raised the sidewalls pretty significantly on this shoe yeah. to lean further into the bucket seat feel, more security, more stability, definitely increases stiffness to the shoe. We'll talk about the pros and cons of that. And also as a result of the new midsole foam, the, the whole base of the shoe got widened even a bit more over the Caldera 6. The outsole is a slight update to their own in-house rubber. So we're now looking Brooks Trail Tech green outsole, which is their own design. It's uh, sticky, supposed to work well on, you know, wet, damp surfaces. Got a new outsole pattern as well over the Caldera 6. Finn, what kind of mileage did you get in, in this old beefy chonker? 100.6 miles on the dot. This was the first shoe that I officially tracked on Strava. I retired my Converse All-Stars. Uh, all on Salt Lake City trails, Mill Creek Canyon, Bonneville Shoreline Trail above Salt Lake City. And uh, longest run was 2.5 hours. Nice. Uh, I got in 86.7 miles. I was definitely planning to go to the full hundred if it weren't for one slight fit issue that I developed over, or I guess that I learned existed over the course of some of the longer runs I did. So would have hit that hundred, but I just couldn't do it. Um, longest run I did in the shoe was three hours and that was in like three inches of wet slush. And mm. it was like 37 degrees and pouring rain the whole time. So it was absolutely miserable. So if that's not trying to hit a hundred miles, I don't know what is, but I, I, I got to run in mud, like dry, cold snow. I got to run in slush. I got the shoes completely soaked. I ran on the roads. So I really took it through kind of all the things I, I, I you know, switched up the paces a lot as well. Um, but yeah, the, the one fit issue that I ran into, which kind of goes into our upper and kind of fit analysis was that at the very top on my left shoe, I'm holding the right, but the left shoe at the very top eyelet, um, where the ankle collar just curves over right here. Yeah. That part just turns out it started to bug the hell out of my ankle bone after about two hours of running anything under two hours, no problem. And I tried, if I, if I didn't utilize the top eyelet, I couldn't get the lockdown right. And then my feet would just slide too far forward. So if I use the top eyelet, then the fit was good, but then it would just start to bruise my ankle bone after about two hours. And I noticed that on the three hour run that I did in the slush. And then the next weekend I was going to go for four hours in the shoe, but then I ended up changing shoes after two hours. Cause right around the two hour mark, I could tell it was starting to bug me again. And I didn't want to just leave a bruise there. Cause those types of bruises take a long time to heal without just, you know, stopping running. I had this same problem happen on a, a Solomon shoe a couple years ago. And that one did eventually work itself in after about 200 miles, but mm. that's a really big commitment to have like a mildly pissed off ankle for 200 miles. So that was just kind of a bummer because the upper I thought was supremely comfortable. Um, like you said, the tongue and the lacing system, so good. Like I was able to mm. lock my foot down so well. And I thought this upper actually did work really well. Um, I love the padding in the heel and the angle collar. It's just this, this one piece. I don't think it's that it's too hard. I think it might've just was a, it's like swooped just ever so slightly wrong for my ankle. So that mm. was a huge bummer because comparing, uh, the, the volume in the forefoot to the Caldera six, I thought that this one gained a little bit of volume. Um, I remember the Caldera six toe box, like narrowing down a little bit. Um, and I felt like this one's like retained a little bit higher volume. So, and I like that, but it wasn't like an egregious amount, you know, like the, 
Topo Mountain Racer 3. I thought it was like of just a very nice amount of volume in the upper. And and then, of course, as with most Brooks, you know, I thought the sizing was spot on. Um, my size 10 felt very true to size. That was a long ramble. What well, do you think? One question on the, on that on that three hour run, inclement weather, tough conditions underfoot. How was the drainage with that upper material? You know, I honestly I couldn't even tell you because my feet were like one like there was never even a chance for the shoes to drain out yeah. because I was leg- because there was it started with like six inches of snow on the ground. It was raining so hard over the course of that run. I was just in like a three inch river the whole time of slush. The shoes took you know like a full day to dry out, but you know, it was also just like cold and crappy. So, um, yeah, it's hard to say, like, even though I got them fully soaked, my feet were so frozen that run. It, mm. I think though it was good enough. Like it felt good enough. Like I didn't feel like my feet were getting super soggy. Like, yeah. And I didn't feel like I was clomping around carrying like, you know, an extra pound of water in my shoes. Um, yep. did you get to get them wet at all? Almost every run that was for me with this upper, I guess, to add to what you said, I, I did not experience that same like abrasive feeling around the ankle bone. Although, like I said, maybe the limitation for me was I did, I didn't do a run above two and a half hours. So within that frame, it wasn't an issue. Could be a different story after that. Um, The big win for this upper material for me was the drainage factor. I felt like the material, like I went through a ton of melting snow, ton of mud puddles, and I felt like, you know, the, the, the feet would get fully submerged, drained pretty quickly. I think the biggest thing I felt during runs was like, it, it didn't retain all of the weight from like stomping in that type mm-hmm. of condition. Um, like a lot of shoes sort of become like cement bricks for the rest of the run. I felt like this shoe drained pretty well. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that has to do with just like the materials they chose for the upper. I don't quite have the vocabulary for that, but just like, to explain how it felt on a run. Like it was an amazing, like inclement weather drainage type upper. Yep. And I think part of that is because of this plastic exoskeleton, you know, similar to, um, similar to matrix material, this doesn't really absorb, absorb or hold moisture. So yeah. So who knows? Maybe, maybe it was a good call for the designers, um, to, to switch the upper material up to this one. One thing that was, I found was nice. Um, I guess moving on to like kind of the midsole and outsole analysis yeah. and feel of the shoe. It, and this is one thing Brooks has always taken pride in with their kind of daily trainer midsole foams is their DNA foam. They've always claimed to have the least amount of change due to the temperature. And I've noticed mm-hmm. that in the winter, if you wear a shoe that's moderately firm, it just feels like a brick because uh, that foam just doesn't do well in the cold. I thought this foam did really well in the cold. Like I thought the shoe felt really nice and bouncy and soft, even in some of the days where it was, you know, like well below freezing. And, you know, that just kind of goes to the, I don't know, just the, the well-rounded nature of this DNA law V3 foam. Like yeah. this is turning into, this has turned into one of my favorite kind of daily trainer midsole foams because I, I found it to be very versatile. What do you think? Well, yeah. And I have some, I wanted to ask you a question first. This is one of the first shoes we've reviewed where like, as I'm looking at the bottom of the midsole, the way they kind of melded it into the outsole, it's like a grooved midsole. Can you see that? Are you talking like, like the the midsole foam is like grooved to the outsole lug so that you can kind of like insert that outsole right into the grooves of the midsole. Yeah. It's like wavy on the sides. It's like wavy. I've never seen that in a shoe before. Yeah, I, I've i never seen it enough to the point where I've like noticed it, but I also did take note of that. And I'm thinking, so structurally, what we're doing is we're creating less of a um, solid sidewall on the side, yeah. which when your foot hits the side, it'll help crash a little bit smoother. Um, so we're almost mm-hmm. creating like a segmented crash pad in a way. Yep. So that was probably a design element for Brooks to allow them to widen the base, keep the stability, but not have it feel like a total cinder block underfoot. You know, like it, it provides just a little bit of give under each yeah. of those main lugs. Um, cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Good I eye. Got, Good eye. I'm learning. 
Um, I got a lot of thoughts sort of on the ride. Uh, there's definitely more flex in this shoe compared to the Caldera 6. From what I gather, it comes down to like the cuts, the new cuts they made in this outsole. Agreed. Generally, from what I understand, that makes it easier to run in than the previous version. I think there will probably be some trail runners out there that are concerned that <clears throat> these, <clears throat> excuse me, these cuts compromise grip. I never found that to be the case. I ran in some pretty technical terrain. Um, I would say that despite being a higher stack shoe, it's a pretty stable ride. I think you can probably chalk that up to just like the wider platform. It's got sort of like the bathtub-esque construction. I wondered if there would be stability issues because of the higher stack nature. For me, there weren't any. Like you're not going to fall off this shoe. Um, it's a pretty broad footprint. And yeah, I think like pretty good insurance policy for your ankles. It runs quite smooth, I would say. However, whenever I did try to turn up the volume on like speed, where I was hitting like a pretty angular turn on a trail or things got steep, I did find that I noticed like how much, how, how backloaded the materials are on this shoe. Um, and I think that's the downside of these stability shoes is like by nature. And you and I were t talking offline, like they try to guide your run. Like the analogy is like when you're at a bowling alley and they put the bumpers up, like it's, it's kind of like this shoe more than any shoe we have run in, in recent memory. I felt like, had this overpowering effect to guide each movement. And I think when you get into like unpredictable, unstable terrain, that's where this type of use case becomes readily apparent that it's like going to fall apart. Other things I would say, despite the size, like this is definitely a monster truck shoe. It's, it's beefy as hell. It's not as heavy as you think. Like it just looks big. It feels a lot lighter than the Caldera 6. Um, I think, again, that's probably due to the reworked upper. Because we, you were saying like the stack height didn't really change. It's maybe the upper material. Yeah, um, and the midsole foam's a little bit lighter as well. I mean, I think it lost like 0. 0.3 ounces, but 0. it feels 3. like it. It feels like it lost a whole ounce though. Yeah. The last thing I'll say is, and again, I don't know why this is the case. I, this is probably a question for you. This version to me had more ground feel than the Caldera Six. I don't know if it's because of the new foam. But it is a high stack shoe, which kind of surprised me. Like I was surprised how much I felt in touch with the ground. And so I had this, like, as I was coming up with like my points for this review, I was confused because like you do probably want more ground feel and like technical terrain, but then like the stability factor kind of nixes the the benefit there. So um yeah, that's that's what I had to say about the rod. Yeah, no, those are definitely all good points. I think part of is I also noticed I felt I felt like there was, I could feel the ground a little bit more in the shoe than the Caldera 6. I wouldn't say, though, that the shoe lacked any amount of protection, though. Like, mm. I feel like on rocks, it was still plenty enough protection. Yes. Which, I think this new, this new Loft V3 foam has a little bit more flexibility to it. But I think the other big part is just the new outsole design. So, compared to the Caldera 6, this new outsole, the lugs are further apart and just not as close together. You know, there's not quite as much surface area touching the ground, which I I thought, I think this is an improvement over the Caldera 6. I thought the Caldera 6's outsole was overbuilt. You know, there was like yeah. 5,000 miles worth of rubber on the bottom of that shoe. And like, this seems like a more appropriate amount. And, you know, because of the slightly more spread out lugs, you're just getting bigger areas where the, where the shoe can actually be segmented and, yep. uh, you know, bend a little bit. And who knows, maybe, maybe this new, I, I've, I, I haven't gotten confirmation from Brooks or anything so i'm just speculating but with this new trail tack outsole design you know i know one thing that they're always working on as well is like thinning out the base of the shoe you know like vibram's light base um Terex has been working on it with their continental rubber i imagine brooks has been yep. working on it as well so like even if just the base of the rubber got a quarter of a millimeter thinner like that's going to help increase the uh flexibility as well but um yeah i thought that this shoe was like like you said this is absolutely the bumper bowling uh, equivalent of of a running shoe where it's got the bumpers up if you don't bowl very straight but if you do bowl very straight you're probably they're probably not going to get in your way that much I, I i like the point that you said too about how you know when running on like faster more technical terrain it still wasn't quite the shoe for that because of uh you know the increased stiffness and stack height and yep. and i agree um i think it's it's fine, but definitely like uh, definitely not like the main use case for it, which um, 
kind of brings us to the next segment is like, where did this shoe work best for you? So there, there's all, there, there's so many, it depends statements here for me. <laughs> I think this is a great through hiking shoe. If you're hiking a trail, like the PCT, if we're talking like the Appalachian oh, for trail, sure. different story, different, if it's the Appalachian trail, different story. I think it's a 200 mile shoe, but it's extremely course dependent. Like maybe it's a different story. If it's, you know, again, like a, a 200 mile race up in the Northeast versus the Cocodona 250. I would do long runs in these shoes with the caveat that if I was trying to, um, you know, take some risks in training, but I wanted to mitigate those mileage or volume risks with a more protective, stable shoe, I would go here. But like, if I was training for a race and I wanted that long run to be as applicable as possible, I might not go with the shoe. So there's so many asterisks that said, this shoe is $150. This is one of the lowest price points that I can think of from like a dollars to value standpoint. It's a highly durable shoe. Um, it's has just enough versatility. It can kind of slightly creep into that like more technical trail terrain. This is a $150 budget speed land. Like if you are curious about the speed land GS TAM, but you don't have $275, you can basically get one for 150 bucks here. Um, I was wondering when you were going to throw that out there in this <laughs> review, because I knew you were going to say something about the speed land. <laughs> but I will say this, and I'm, and I'm super conscious of my bias. Like I said, I do have a partnership with Brooks, and I want to be fair. I think what you said earlier about some of this ankle um, material causing issues, that could nix the entire value proposition of this shoe, right? Like if you can't run over two hours in this shoe and feel comfortable, what is this shoe for, right? And so maybe one of the questions in the comments is like, are you experiencing this issue too? Like, is this like a fundamental design flaw that is totally undermining the value prop of the shoe? I don't know. But um, if it doesn't, th this is an amazing budget shoe for you. I have a feeling, I, I have a hunch that there aren't going to be many other people with this, uh, with this ankle issue. I just have kind of low ankle bones. And like, if, if anyone's watched previous reviews, like this is not new to me. Like, you know, like the one that came to mind, like the Adidas Agravic Flow, like that one pissed off my ankles. Yeah, yeah. Gosh, I, there was at least like one or two others that also, you know, pissed off my ankle bones. And this was another one um, just on my left foot. So like, who knows, maybe I just need to wear like two pairs of socks for a while or put a piece of yeah. foam there. Um, but yeah, even the, even the outsole looks like a speed land. Like it's the same shape. <laughs> it's got the same segments. Like it's interesting. And it's, it's kind of like you said too, it's very wide, very stable and it's not, it's not mushy. I don't know if we touched on that for this, this DNA law foam. It's soft. It's soft enough, but it's not mushy, you know, like a Hocus Stinson or even right. a speed goat. I would say that this shoe runs a little bit more responsive than a speed goat, you know, where I thought this shoe was definitely going to work best had it and I'm I'm going to say like, assuming I don't have this little ankle issue on the upper, this shoe is totally your, like still your all day long run. You know, we, we, in the Caldera six interview, we said that this was the crock pot, you know, it was the set it and forget it. Like you just put it on, you go run. I still think the shoe is like that, except, except it's a little bit more fun than the previous one. It did yeah. just get a little bit more fun, but it's still very much like a, I would prefer to run hundred mile effort, you know, all day paced runs in this shoe, because I felt like I was able to just like comfortably jog in this shoe for an indefinite amount of time, shy of that little, uh, little ankle spot, but like the midsole outsole, I was like, dude, this is a go forever sort of shoe. I've got three shoes currently on my short list for the Cocodona 50 earlier this year. The first one is the New Balance Fresh Foam X3 Trail V More, I think it's called. That's a mouthful. It's a it. mouthful. It's some order of those words. <laughs> Go check it out. It's an amazing shoe. Uh, the new, the Speedland GS Tam and, and this guy right here. Yeah, I think those are definitely some great um, like competitor shoes. Uh, the other ones that I had written down that I feel like fall into this category of competitor versus the Caldera 7 are the Hoka Speed Goat and the A6 Tribuco Max 2, both of which were like very comfortable, cushioned, no rock play, you know, set it and forget it type shoes. And, you know, this one, 
up until I went on some long runs in it was very much creeping into the like, oh my gosh, this is going to dethrone the A6 Tribuco Max 2 for the ultimate long run shoe for me. Because of that one little upper issue, it, it is not. But I have, I'm confident that most people are not going to have uh, any problems around the ankle. And like, if that's the case, then this this shoe is right on par with that A6 Tribuco Max 2 for me. And and like wildly, it's also a very direct competitor to the GS, the Speedland GS TAM, which is amazing because it's $125 cheaper. Um, oh, a question. I guess you had said it's on your short list for Coca Dona. So you would you would race in this shoe? I would race in this shoe at the 200 mile distance and above. I you might even do anything shorter. Or like some, some multi. I don't think so. You yeah. Know, actually, yeah. I don't think so. I yeah, don't okay. think so. Yeah. I, I totally could have seen myself doing a, like a big mountain long alternate, like, you know, like a UTMB, a hard rock, um, yeah. a run rabbit run, like those sorts of mountainous races where I'm not going fast. This would have been the one for me, but it didn't quite hit the mark on the upper, which was so unfortunate. So, so for that reason, you know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't race in it, but if, if that upper issue didn't exist, this would definitely be on my short list of like big mountain race shoes. What's your, what's your question for the, for the viewers? Well, so my question is why does the Cascadia exist? When are you picking a Cascadia over this shoe? Hmm. I mean, what do you think? I, I just think the shoe's so comfortable and like, there's nothing I'm going to do in a Cascadia that I wouldn't do better in this shoe. That's, that's my, that's my hot take. That's a good, that's a real, that's a really good prompt. You, cool. you got, you got anything for any questions for the audience? I mean, I think, yeah, I think the, the, my main is just like, why does the Cascadia exist is still, is still my main one. And I, you know, it's got the name recognition, so I understand that. But from a feature standpoint, I don't know, this just seems the future of Brooks, Brooks trail running to me. It's a really competitive, it's a really compelling question. I mean, you know, I've, I threw hiked the Appalachian trail in a Cascadia eight. It is, it was already a through hiking shoe before this shoe ever came about, um, yeah, I, I I'm I'm kind of stumped. I think it's I think it's a really 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 good question. Yeah. Maybe a question that we ask Brian Bark later this year. Yeah, yeah. Let's just on point. Just be like, why does the Cascadia still exist? <laughs> I'm sh yeah, I'm sure he'll love that. But uh, yeah, if you thought this review was um, useful and valuable to you, and you want to try out this shoe, and your local run specialty shop does not have the Brooks Caldera Seven. You know, feel free to uh, use the link in the show notes to purchase this shoe from our friends at Running Warehouse. Your purchase helps uh, support the channel, allows us to keep doing reviews like this. Um, you know, we're in the heart of winter now, and I feel like we we do have we've got like at least one, maybe two, like winter adjacent yeah. shoe reviews coming up. Like, I'm not going to say like full winter review, just because like I don't know. I just don't think we're quite ready for like reviewing a shoe with spikes yet. I mean. Also, because like I went for a run today and it was 50 degrees and dirt, but I've, I've, I've touched snow at least a little bit. So, uh, yeah, we got some fun stuff on the horizon and, uh, thanks for watching everyone. Be sure to like subscribe, share this with your friends, go try out a Brooks Caldera seven. We'll catch everyone in the next review.